honor up here very quickly. Um, I've been given the job and really the honor of calling us to order and to honor our friend and leader, our founding dean, Harry Harding. Dean Harding has offered to give us um, a last lecture. Uh, he has promised a few final thoughts and wisdom on a day of many endings and even more promising beginnings. As your master of ceremonies, I will inform you that after Dean Harding has concluded his remarks, staff, faculty, and student leaders have three very brief presentations before refreshments. I will withhold further comments until after Harry speaks, other than saying by way of introduction uh, that I'd simply like to observe that few of us would be here. I know I would not be here. I see many faces who would not be here. And indeed, I don't think we would be in this wonderful hall um, with some of the warm feelings in the Batten family and the Batten school, but for our speaker's leadership. So I'd like to begin our ceremony today by quoting George Will, writing in Washington, D.C., of one of his, uh, one of our principal founders, Alexander Hamilton. And Will wrote, quote, if you seek his monument, look around you. Nothing could be more apt than that for Harry Harding. Dean Harry Harding. Thank you all so much. Jerry, I've never heard somebody stand in this um, room and quote Alexander but I guess that's okay. Thank you all for coming. I know I've likened uh, the semester to a long relay race uh, in which some of you are carrying several batons at the moment as you make that final dash to the finish line. I know uh, you're very tired. We're all very tired, but very excited about the conclusion of yet another a very successful academic year. It's a great pleasure to be here, uh, somewhat bittersweet obviously, but to share some thoughts with you about some aspects of leadership and public policy. Now it's dangerous for someone of my generation to make a popular cultural reference to people primarily of your generation, although I see some mixed faces. And we'll see how many, if any of you, get the reference, can fill in the blank. One of the most iconic films of my generation was The Graduate, co-written by Buck Henry and directed by Mike Nichols and starring a very young Dustin Hoffman. It's the story of a rather aimless college graduate named Ben, who has become increasingly disenchanted with the world that his parents and their friends inhabit and in fact is wondering why he ever went to college in the first place. One scene in The Graduate contains what has become one of the most frequently quoted lines in movie history from which I've drawn inspiration for my remarks tonight. One of Ben's father's friends, a Mr. McGuire, tries to offer a bit of helpful advice to the young man as he ponders his future. And here's how the dialogue goes. Mr. McGuire. I want to say just one word to you, just one word. Are you listening? And ben says, yes, I am. And Mr. McGuire says? Glasses. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. I wish I'd seen who said that. I did that with Dubby Wynn, who many of you know was the colleague of uh, Frank Batten, uh, who uh, and, uh, were encouraging uh, Mr. Batten to give the money to create the Batten School. Dubby was a classmate of mine in college, in fact, so we're of exactly the same generation. And I said, I'm going to sum it up in one word uh, for them, Dubby. And I told him the story, and he said instantly, plastics. You have to be probably of my generation. How many of you not of my generation? Wow, here we go. Very good. Very good. Or sort of middle generation. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. But then the dialogue continues. Ben says, how do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Now, like Mr. McGuire, I also have one word for you today. Are you listening? It's context. And if, like Ben, you ask, how do I mean? My answer is that unless you know how to understand the context in which you work, you won't have a great future, either in policy analysis or as a civic leader. And my remarks this afternoon are my encouragement to you to think about it. 
My hope is that you'll appreciate the importance of context better than Ben Braddock appreciated the opportunity in plastics, but we'll see. Now, when I arrived at the Batten School just about five years ago now to take up the uh, duties as the first dean, though with David Brenneman in the room, I always realized he was really the first dean. He was just too modest to hold the title, but the first person with the title of dean. I was neither a specialist in the study of leadership nor a specialist in public policy. I came here after having spent a career primarily studying China and American relations with China and having served as the dean of a professional school of international affairs. So for the topic of my inaugural lecture, for which this lecture serves as a kind of bookend five years later, I realized that China would not be the right approach because this is not a school of Asian studies or a school of international affairs. So the topic that I chose was globalization. I discussed the dimensions of globalization, what it is, the causes of globalization, why it's happening, and its consequences, the challenges it was posing for individuals, societies, and governments, the United States and around the world. Now, I realized that, in effect, I was speaking about a major piece of the context, the modern context. I was speaking about one of the most important drivers that was then and is still reshaping the policy environment in virtually every country in the world. And since giving, given that lecture five years ago, and since teaching several courses on leadership and on the history of public policy, I've come to the conclusion that context is indeed one of the most important things that both policy analysts and civic leaders need to understand. For policy analysts, context shapes the problems that they must address and at least partially determines the financial, material, and political resources they can use to manage those problems. For leaders, context helps define the fit between the knowledge and skills they bring to their job and the demands of that position. Context therefore helps explain one of, to me, the most fascinating puzzles in the study of leadership. Why some leaders succeed in a certain position while others fail, and even more intriguingly, why a leader who succeeds brilliantly in one setting may fail spectacularly in another, or in happier situations, if that leader is given a second chance, the other way around. In short, context matters. And while in these brief remarks, I can't possibly provide a comprehensive overview of the evolving context you will be facing, either as leaders or as analysts, or what they will mean for your work in those roles, I do want to offer a few suggestions about how to look at context and how to assess its impact. Perhaps the most important aspect of context for leaders has to do with the expectation just of their followers, but also of the other major stakeholders who occupy a 360-degree space around them, their superiors, their subordinates, their colleagues inside their organization, and their counterparts outside it. I'll pause to parenthetically note that the moment that I became aware of the importance of expectations as a kind of context occurred right in this room sitting out there where more or less you are, listening to one of our big questions in leadership series, uh, where a panel of scholars of women leaders asked the question, uh, not uh, do women lead differently than men, but must women lead differently than men? I was puzzled by the title when it was given to us. But basically, their answer was, yes, they must, because they have to be aware of the expectations that others, especially male subordinates, have about how leaders should lead and how women will lead. And that one of the big challenges for women leaders, according to that excellent panel, was that uh, basically male leaders, or any leader, is going to have, if they're female, is going to have to understand um, the expectations of their followers uh, and uh, may uh, get trapped if they don't understand those expectations uh, correctly. So expectations are important. They usually involve both substance and style, what the stakeholders want their leaders to achieve and how they want them to achieve it. Often the expectations regarding objectives are far more explicit than those regarding style. 
But either way, leaders are often selected because of the anticipation that they will meet those expectations. And that's why new leaders often enjoy a honeymoon period for a time after they take office or assume responsibility. It's because key stakeholders, at least the ones who supported the selection of the new leader, are optimistic that he or she will fulfill their expectations. This is also why new leaders speak of having received a mandate. That refers to that they are defining for the organization or society they're leading will mesh with the aspirations of their followers. Now the challenge that leaders face is not just whether they actually have the knowledge, skills, and style to fulfill those stakeholder expectations, but whether they have accurately assessed those expectations in the first place. One of the biggest mistakes a leader can make is to get that assessment wrong, to assume that what they want for the organization or community they are serving is what their key stakeholders, stakeholders on whose support they will depend, also want. If those expectations diverge, the leader's mandate will prove hollow and the honeymoon may be brief. At that point, leaders have two basic choices if they are to recover and to succeed. They can either remold their behavior or acquire the knowledge and skills that will enable them better to meet the expectations of the stakeholders, or they can try to reshape those expectations so that their stakeholders will provide more support for their leadership. In fact, that second possibility is my working definition of transformational leadership. Not necessarily the scope of change that a leader creates, although that is the most common definition of the term, but rather whether the leader is able to transform expectations, especially of followers, so that they come to want something that they never wanted before, to recognize an interest of which they had been previously unaware, or to support a course of action or a style of leadership that they did not previously appreciate was in their interest. In that way, I distinguish between facilitative leadership, in which leaders help followers and others to advance or achieve their existing definition of interest, and transformational leadership, through which leaders persuade followers and others to change their definition of interest. That's why, as difficult as facilitative leadership may be, as hard as it sometimes is to help followers solve problems and implement effective solutions, transformational leadership is even more challenging. If you've read any of the books on leadership by Ronald Heifetz at Harvard, you know that each concludes with a chapter that lists the daunting challenges faced by leaders who try to be transformational, including, and here I admit Heifetz can get a bit melodramatic in these passages, assassination, suicide, or mental and physical breakdown because it's so hard to try to get people to want something that they did not want before. But as important as they are, the expectations of stakeholders are not the only elements of context that matter for leaders. Different types of organizations have different organizational cultures, and those organizational cultures carry enduring expectations about leadership, especially about the desired or the customary leadership styles. And that's why leaders who succeed in one setting, say the military or in business, may fail in another, say higher education or the nonprofit world. Think of the passage in Richard Neustadt's classic book, Presidential Power, that describes Harry Truman pondering the difficulties his successor, uh, former General Dwight D. Eisenhower, would encounter in the Oval Office. He'll sit here and he'll say, do this, do that, Truman speculated, and nothing will happen. Poor Ike, it won't be like the army. He'll find it very frustrating. In other words, Truman believed that the leadership style most familiar to Eisenhower would be the use of command, whereas he would find that the leadership style that was required in government, as Neustadt uh, emphasized, would be the ability to persuade. So organizational mission, structure, and culture are all important elements of context. Each has important implications for successful leadership styles. But organizational culture and stakeholder expectations not only vary from organization to organization, as in the case of a former army general assuming the US presidency,
but they can evolve over time. Styles of leadership that once were commonplace, such as authoritarian or transactional, are today increasingly seen as being somewhat out of date, as followers have come to expect leadership styles that are more participatory or more motivational. So in that sense, context changes not only over space, as a leader moves from one kind of organization to another, but also over time, as organizational culture and stakeholder expectations evolve around a leader. A third aspect of context for leaders is the level of the organization for which they are responsible. I was just mentioning horizontal movement from one kind of organization to another, and now I'm referring to vertical movement from one level of organization to another. The higher a leader rises, the more complex the issues he will face, the less direct understanding she will have of the day-to-day -day work of the members of, the, of her organization, the wider her span of control, in other words, the more people uh, she is likely to have to manage, and the more often she will have to exercise cross-boundary leadership with counterparts in other organizations. It's perhaps for this reason that leadership becomes more challenging the higher you rise uh, that led the legendary Lawrence J. Peter, then a professor of education at the University of Southern California, to formulate a humorous but insightful proposition that has become known as the Peter Principle. And I quote him, in a hierarchy, every employee tends to rise to his level of incompetence. Peter therefore predicted that every post in every organization would eventually be occupied by someone who was incapable of fulfilling his or her duties, leading to complete organizational failure. Now, I'm not that pessimistic, but I do agree that promotion is actually a risk for leaders, since the expectations they will be expected to meet and the duties they will be expected to perform may overwhelm them because they will be so much more complicated and demanding than what they've experienced before. Now, so far, I've been talking about the importance of context for leaders. Let me say a few words about the importance of context for policy analysts. Context is important for policy analysts because it both shapes the agendas they will be addressing and structures the resources that will be at their disposal to deal with those issues. In considering this aspect of context, I found it useful to try to identify the major drivers that are shaping those policy agendas both in the United States and abroad. Globalization, which was the topic of my inaugural lecture, is one such driver, and it's one that continues to be of great importance. Others, which I considered in the fall semester uh, when I taught my version of our course on the changing context of public policy, include such trends as the following. Demographic change, the changing ethnic, age, and in some cases, gender composition of a society. Generational change, the changing values, preferences, and identities of successive generations, including, as apply, implied above, their general expectations about leadership and their attitudes towards government and towards public policy. Technological changes, which can fundamentally alter a variety of existing issues and often create new and unanticipated ones. Socioeconomic change, especially growing inequality, slower economic growth, and higher levels of structural unemployment. Now, while it's necessary to do what I've just done, to identify the drivers that will change the policy agenda and shape the ways in which, and shape the ways in which leaders and analysts attempt to manage those issues, it will be even more important to assess the relative importance of those drivers and, above all, to estimate their specific implications for policy. I spent two intellectually rewarding years in New York after I left my previous deanship, working on the fringes of Wall Street for a new and growing startup venture, a political risk consultancy. And what I learned there was that political forecasting, predicting what was going to happen politically in an emerging market or in a fraught international relationship, was only the first step in our analysis. In fact, our clients could get forecasts from many other uh, sources, some just as insightful as ours. Where we added value was to help our clients understand what the future developments we predicted 
what does specifically mean for them? And in that regard, some of you have heard me use an analogy based on the focus of Frank Batten's great entrepreneurial venture, the Weather Channel. It's one thing to get the weather forecast right. That's hard enough, although I think we're doing much better over time. It's hard enough. But it's quite another to help people and organizations assess the relevance of that forecast for their particular circumstances. A forecast of heavy rain, for example, has very different implications for drought-stricken farmers than it does for outdoor wedding planners. In one case, it's welcome. In another, it's horrendous. And taking that next step in analysis, moving from what next to so what, is just as important for policymakers as it is for asset managers. We need to forecast both what will happen in general terms, how those drivers will shape the context, but what that will mean for policy. When we do so, I suspect that we'll discover that some of the drivers that I've mentioned, and maybe others as well, will be what I call mega drivers, drivers whose impact will be very broad and very deep, affecting many different issues in fundamental ways. One of the most obvious of these mega drivers uh, is, um, is climate change. Uh, new technologies such as genetic engineering, nanotechnology, and 3D printing may be mega drivers too. And certainly globalization continues to be a mega driver, reshaping so many societies in so many ways and affecting so many policy issues. Moreover, some of these mega drivers in turn will create what some call wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems that have no calculable solutions, little if any room to test alternatives through experimentation or trial and error, little tolerance for failure, and no likelihood, in fact, that the problems will ever finally be solved or will disappear, but simply have to be managed forever. Now, no leader wants to face such wicked problems. They'd rather face what are called the opposite tame problems, actually. But this may prove inevitable, at least for some of us, at some points in our careers. So forecasting the impact of drivers is at least as important as identifying and understanding them in the first place. So my point this afternoon has been to encourage you to learn how to identify the key dimensions of context that you will face as leaders and understand the way in which the evolution of those contexts will shape the policy agendas you face as analysts. But context is important for scholars as well. We would benefit from far more empirical research on how context determines the success and failure of leaders and how leaders can most effectively adapt to the changing context around them. We also need informed forecasts, necessarily both contingent and probabilistic, on the impact of major social, economic, political, and technological drivers on our policy agendas. And I may try my hand at some of this especially the importance of changing context for leaders in my own future work. Now, although I'll be stepping down from the deanship relatively soon, I plan to remain on the faculty here at UVA, but dividing my time between Charlottesville and Hong Kong, devoting more time to research and writing, but also building a partnership between UVA and the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, which is launching new programs in leadership and public policy with a particular focus on Hong Kong, China, and the rest of Asia. This will enable me to be closer to my son, Jamie, my daughter-in-law, Vicky, my new granddaughter, Emma, all of whom live in Shanghai, and will finally allow me to live together with my beloved partner, Shirley Lin, who many of you know, in two communities, Hong Kong and Charlottesville, that are very different places, but that we have both come to love and at the same time to work with not two, but three great universities, UVA, HKSUST, and Shirley's home institution, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. These institutions are also quite different, but they share a common commitment to first-rate research and education. These five years, which will soon conclude, have been enormous fun. I've learned a lot. I've tried to share some of what I've learned with you today and I hope I've made a small contribution too. What more could anyone ask for but that? Thanks very much for the opportunity and thanks for coming today.
Thank you so much, Harry. Um, and don't think you get off that easy. Um, three groups of Harry's admiring constituencies wish to make very brief comments today, and it is my honor to speak as a member of his Batten administration team. We have a modest, uh, but I believe highly symbolic gift we'd like to present, and it's accompanied by the following proclamation, soon to be issued, I understand, uh, if they don't have gridlock, by the University of Virginia's Faculty Senate. And I'd like to read it briefly uh, because we members of your staff feel that this document conveys our sentiments and our admiration for Harry uh, better than another Warburg speech. Resolution for Harry Harding. Whereas Harry Harding will soon complete his tenure as the very first dean of the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy, where he has served with great dedication and distinction since 2009. Whereas he worked closely with university leaders to secure Frank Batten's vision for establishing a school of public policy grounded firmly on the premise that one can lead from anywhere. Whereas he has led efforts to build a first-rate faculty by attracting scholars and practitioners with diverse interests, research agendas, and experience to the Batten School. Whereas he has led the establishment of the Bachelor of Arts program in public policy and leadership and the continuous growth and development of the Master of Public Policy program. Whereas student enrollment in Batten School programs has grown from 50 students to nearly 300 students during his term. Whereas by supervising major renovations and providing, I might add, extraordinary architectural advice, hosting high-profile public events featuring prominent scholars, politicians, and policy and private sector leaders in Garrett Hall, he has reinvigorated one of the university's most historic buildings, furthering intellectual vibrancy on central grounds. Whereas under his leadership, the Batten School has established a strong presence and reputation in both Richmond and Washington, D.C., becoming known for Batten School's dedication to public service, scholarship, and engagement on the major policy issues of our time. Whereas he and his partner, Shirley Lynn, have opened their residence in Pavilion 3 repeatedly, bringing together students and faculty across disciplines with thought leaders from the local, national, and international policy communities for vibrant discussions of wide-ranging topics. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we in the Batten community commend Harry Harding for his visionary leadership and entrepreneurial spirit, virtuous work that has quickly established the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy is one of the most innovative and forward-thinking in the nation. Now, Harry, before turning to Chris Room, who will speak on behalf of our faculty colleagues, uh, we members of your Batten School staff wish to present you with a book that bears all of our thoughts and some extraordinary personal dedications uh, and conveys our sentiments. It also conveys our profound admiration for your leadership, as well as your extraordinary personal courage as you overcame grave circumstances to lead us energetically onward. If you'll come forward, please, I must make this presentation in person. The book... It's not leadership for dummies. It? <laughs> it's not leadership for dummies. The book is by John F. Kennedy, and its title conveys better than any of our words possibly can our profound respect and admiration for you. Thank you so much. You have to open it. Okay? Changing context, <laughs> you never open a present if it's given to you in China, ever, in front of the person. You always say thank you very much and take it away. But I'm not in China, so I can open it. And it is indeed Profiles of Courage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's really nice to have the opportunity to uh, present remarks on behalf of the faculty. And I actually uh, thought that would be a pretty easy job in the sense that I just make a list of all the things that Harriet has done for us, and then I'd read the list to you. So can, can you hear me if I go away from the microphone? <laughs> there was a little bit of a problem. Well, you can, 
you can kind of get the idea. Then Jerry told me I had two minutes. So what to do now? So, so this is really Anna White. a quandary for me. What, what do I talk about here? So, you know, I could talk about vision. When I got here, and I think when most of us got, or many of us got here, the Batten School was in Varsity Hall with a small number of people. And even before that, of course, there were even fewer. And so under Harry's vision, we've grown to what we are now. Uh, I could talk about his wisdom and his in imperturbability. And so, you know, one thing I want you to realize is when you're a dean, people don't very often come to your office and say, everything is wonderful, and I just wanted to tell you how great things are. That's not usually the way it works. And yet, Harry, I have never seen him get upset. I'm sure there are times inside, but, you know, you take a lot as dean, and, and Harry just would would do it without getting upset, without getting perturbed, and that's really admirable. Of course, Harry's courage. I mean, we all know there were some personal challenges, and I think we all admire the way you dealt with them. Certainly Harry's eloquence. Um, you know, I have seen so many times Harry would get up, sometimes talking off the cuff, rarely with notes. Today was unusual, and just the words that came out of Harry's mouth are so so wonderful and eloquent. I've just been admiration because I could never do it. And I think we all feel that. Harry's compassion. Uh, you know, Harry really cares about the people here. I remember a, a small comment that Laura made when we were, uh, before we moved into the building, but it was something to the effect of, Harry wants things to be the best for the faculty, for the staff, and for the students. And you know, you don't find a lot of leaders who, who that's, kind of one of their first concerns. Uh, and, and of course, Harry's overall leadership. I mean, th these are just so adm admirable. But, you know, then I have my, the rest of my list I can't really quite get to here. So I just wanted to say uh, for all of us, for all the faculty, what a privilege it has been uh, these last five years. Well, we haven't all been here all of the five years, but for parts of it, it's a privilege today. And also, as we go forward, you know, this is not the end. This is continuing and so into the future as well. Um, and also, we will have a small token that we're sharing with the students. So uh, we'll wait. We'll wait to have that presented. But thank you very much, Harry. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lauren Critchie, the previous president of the Batten Undergraduate Council. And I'm Alex Dimitri, the previous president of the Graduate Council. Um, and we just wanted to say a couple words um, and thank Dean Harding for everything he's done for the students. Um, I can say that as one of the members of the first ever Batten undergraduate class, I applied to and committed to the program before it even really existed. So I think that says a lot for Dean Harding's uh, use of persuasion, um, but I, I will say that we have all found a home in Batten that um, would not have existed without Dean Harding and his leadership. Um, not only a home here in Garrett, which I think he's done a lot to his credit to um, make this beautiful space, but also opening up his own home. Um, I know my roommates who aren't in Batten are very jealous that I get to spend time in a pavilion um, and also here in Batten. So thank you very much um, on behalf of the students, and I know from our time on the search committee, also for a new dean, that they will have very big shoes to fill as you have uh, stayed very true to the values of Frank Batten. So, thank you. And on behalf, on behalf of the graduate students, I would again like to thank you for your commitment and um, for your availability and for even teaching our classes. Um, and together with the faculty, we would like to present you with um, some memories from your time here and from our time here. So um, this one is to commemorate your um, help in establishing Garrett Hall to how beautiful it is and um, its original glory. And this one is um, at graduation last year and they're signed by members of both the faculty and the staff. So, so thank you. Yes. Thank you so, so much. I see there's some Chinese here, which I have not tried. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my chin, it's over inside. Okay. 
Thank, Thank you, you all very much. Thank you very, very much. Thanks.